Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Chuck Hoberman. Uh, I'm a, a lecturer at the GSD and a visiting scholar at the Wies Institute. And uh, I want to thank um, uh, the GSD uh, and Dean Mostafavi for, uh, for hosting this event. And this is also sponsored by the uh, Rouse Visiting Artist, um, I guess, fund. Uh, so thanks to them as well. And additionally, I would like to, uh, to also thank the Wies Institute, uh, who has been uh, just a huge uh, uh, supporter of this collaborative approach uh, between different disciplines, and in particular between design and uh, engineering. So I'm going to, uh, we have uh, some really uh, uh, exemplary, really great practitioners uh, of this field I'm calling informal robotics today. Uh, and uh, we'll have a discussion afterwards. Uh, but I'm going to start with a short presentation of my own. And basically, there are two things I want to address in this presentation. Uh, the first is just what is informal robotics? It happens to be a term that I coined, so I guess I can define it. Um, uh, but also, why is it here at the design school, uh, which is probably a more open-ended question, but one that I think will be interesting and hopefully we'll have uh, some interesting conversations about. So I actually, um, uh, I think most of you know, uh, you know, I'd make transformable structures, but I actually did work as a roboticist for about five years of my career after I graduated from uh, Columbia uh, with my engineering degree. And I worked for a company called Honeybee Robotics and Spacecraft Mechanisms Corporation. And what we did was, if you look at the picture on the left, we did a lot of installations in uh, some, some, some pretty downscale factories in the Northeast, really kind of, uh, you know, old style. Uh, putting robot arms in to do uh, various pick and place tasks, material handling, some assembly. Uh, but we developed another client, which was the space agency, NASA, uh, at the time. And they asked us to look into how to make robots construct uh, truss structures uh, in space. So it was translating a kind of a very kind of high tech, future oriented vision of this articulated robot. Uh, and we developed this test bed, which you see in the middle of a robot arm uh, doing, this, uh, doing this assembly. Then I went on and founded my own company, Hoberman Associates, began to make these transformable structures, toys, et cetera. But if we sort of forward, go forward 10 years, I don't know if any of you have, uh, have heard of this movie um, or seen this movie. Uh, it was called, it came out in 1997. It was called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, directed by Errol Morris. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic documentary uh, with uh, four kind of indelible characters who really have nothing to do with each other except what the director could imagine. But one of them was Rodney Brooks from MIT who coined this phrase. And this was a very different idea of a robot than the ones you just saw, because the idea was that you would make robots that were smaller and flexible and lighter, and you could make many, many of them. And this vision of robotics was really, I think, um, uh, actually quite transformative for a lot of people, a lot of how people thought about the field and really what would be possible with intelligent devices in general. So although, you know, you go back to when I started in the 80s, which was kind of an early wave of optimism about robots, and people thought a lot about the future, but I think they kind of thought about it like these two images. We could have these sort of very uh, uh, industrial, heavy robot arms doing useful tasks, and if we want to project this forward and see where it's going, it's going to look be some kind of humanoid object, but one that has the same uh, technological makeup and constructive logic as the arm itself. Uh, and when I came uh, up, when I started coming up to uh, the Wies Institute here, I got, I was introduced to the robotics work going on at the Wies, the so-called bio-inspired robotics platform and a lot of different labs around the country and around the world that were making a very different style uh, and very different conception of what a robotic device is. Rather than being heavy and metal, uh, produced in a factory, assembled with industrial components. Uh, it was light. These were devices that are light and flexible, compliant, uh, ideas like printable on the demand, uh, even virtually uh, soft. And so in looking at this work, I kind of was trying to say, you know, you'll see, I'll show you a whole series of examples, but I came up with the term informal in the sense of casual, not in the sense of there's no form, but it's a kind of a casual, uh, approach. And also, I've gotten a little pushback from some of the designers who say that's, you know, this is hard to do. It's not easy in that sense, but I like the term, and so I've stuck with it. So the essential idea that uh, this, uh, by the way, we're going to have glitches throughout the, uh, these presentations, so bear with us. Um, 
the, uh, uh, the basic idea of what I think an informal device is about is one where the uh, material and the, the material logic and the robotic behavior are really closely intertwined. If you think about a, a big heavy metal robot, sure, it's highly engineered, uh, it has to be very precise, uh, but once you've chosen that way of constructing, you more or less can receive, you can, you can basically design it in a straightforward way and get down to optimization and, um, uh, and programming. Uh, whereas if you make something out of these informal materials, you actually have to think a lot about how the material, the computation, the actuation, the sensing are all embedded with each other. And after all, that's a lot closer to the way organisms are than a robot itself. So I'm gonna just run through a kind of a, a spectrum of inf what I'm calling informal devices uh, out of a number of different labs. Uh, this is work coming out of the uh, microrobotics lab uh, at Harvard and Rob Wood is gonna be presenting who leads that lab. And what you're seeing here is a bee and then a robotic bee next to it, same size, same form, same functionality. And then as we zoom in on that one little shoulder of the bee, you see a little two degree of freedom spherical joint, this is the technical term, but it's printable. It's, it's printed with like laminated, uh, by laminating layers of, uh, of kind of, uh, of uh, between hinged, uh, uh, hinged material, and you can make a lot of them, you can make them small, and you can make them very precise. And then here's the, uh, I should have uh, listened to Matt and put the, uh, put this. So here you see the bee flying back and forth. Bear with me. So a lot of this work is so-called bio-inspired. This is a water strider that is leaping off of a, uh, a water surface using surface tension as its platform. And then on the right, and virtually visually almost indistinguishable from the uh, original insect, is one that uh, is uh, able to do the same thing coming out of Seoul National uh, University. Once you can make these foldable, laminated, mechanisms, you can start to think about printing flat and basically self-assembly, self-organization. And this is another project coming out of the microrobotics lab uh, with Rob and one of the researchers, Sam Felton, where it's really, the f in, in, a, in a certain way, is the first self-folding, self-assembling, crawling robot. Uh, in terms of what, you know, the fast, cheap, and out of control uh, 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 paradigm, this is also work, this is work coming out of Radhika Nagpal's group uh, at the School of Engineering here at Harvard. And it's uh, so-called kilobots because there's actually a thousand individual robots that are controlled with two little cell phone motors that sort of vibrate and you can steer them around. And the important point though is that the logic of the machines is not global. There's nothing controlling the swarm. All of the rules are actually embedded in the little devices themselves. Soft robots is a very important kind of another very important direction in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, constellation of different types of robotic devices. This is a uh, an inflatable uh, uh, robot with individual chambers, and you're getting this fantastic biomorphic kind of crawling. It can crawl under objects. This is coming out of the Whitesides group uh, at Harvard, and there's a lot of expertise uh, sort of really sprinkled around Harvard and MIT and communities. Uh, uh, in different places. Once you're making soft, you can actually start to look at wearables, actually fabric devices, and we'll have Connor Walsh uh, from, uh, from Harvard presenting later on these assistive devices where you basically put on a garment, it's made of, it's made of fabric, uh, tension-based actuators, cables, et cetera, and actually can change the force profiles to either, either enhance performance or to assist uh, against certain deficits. Origami is another really important piece of, uh, of the inspiration for these things. This is a, another little robot coming out of Seoul National University and it meets an obstacle and transforms itself. And this is kind of my, one of the sort of entry points for me is this idea of transformable devices. And then 3, 3D printed devices is also very much a part of it. Uh, this is a little hexapod. Uh, and we'll be talking more uh, in the discussion. Rob McCurdy is going to be talking about some of his strategies for 3D printing uh, robotic devices. So I've even like dipped my toe in the water a little bit. Um, I've been teaching a course on this, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but um, this is a, um, a device that I came up about a year and a half ago. It's a folding reconfigurable cuboid. It can make, take, make a lot of uh, configurations. It's kind of a, a, what I call a prismatic structure. And working with um, 
uh, James Weaver at the Wies Institute and Katia Bertoldi and uh, Johannes Overveld, we are developing our little reconfigurable, uh, transformable uh, robotic devices. Uh, so basically, that's, it's, it's more or less of a bu building block idea uh, for making, for making these, these types of robots. Uh, so within this spectrum of behaviors, materials, et cetera, uh, they are, I'm basically, for no good reason except that it appears to me that it's kind of a, uh, there's this uh, 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 almost um, philosophical or a, a, a relationship and affinity between all of them. Uh, we have this area called informal robotics. And where does this then sit in, the, in, a, in, in a wider spectrum of, um, of design issues? Basically, what I'm, what I'm positing is that informal robotics is one expression among many of the convergence between material and computation. And without going into really, I'm just touching on this, there is in time, but I think we may, maybe we'll bring it up in discussion. But you can really look at what's coming out of both uh, kind of the uh, 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 design universities and engineering and research universities. And there are many, many different expressions of how uh, computation is getting further and further embedded into the material. The material is taking on more and more characteristics uh, of intelligence. So whether it's smart material systems or metamaterials, which are basically artificial materials that uh, have properties that natural materials don't, so-called 4D printing, which have uh, where 3D printed objects have a time, performance, programmable matter. All of these things, I think, are kind of in a uh, some kind of a constellation with informal robotics. And then the last thing I'm going to just uh, uh, briefly wanted to, to mention is the other connection with uh, design is through uh, teaching, through the pedagogy of uh, uh, teaching students at the design school how to kind of work in this space. And so last year I, um, uh, I started a course uh, which is, um, I have some great uh, uh, teaching fellows, uh, Dan Aukus and John Grin Jonathan Grinham, who work with me on this. Uh, and we conceived of a course where the idea was that design students could actually not just like learn the technology, et cetera, but actually make a meaningful contribution to the research community uh, in this area. And so now I'm just going to play a short video to show you some of the student work on this, which hopefully won't glitch up too much. Spectacular work, and the, uh, uh, the students at the GSD are, uh, they truly astonish me on a regular basis. Um, so uh, I will, um, I'm going to give the introductions to our three speakers kind of uh, all at once at the beginning, and then, um, uh, uh, and then they'll come up uh, one by one. So Rob, why don't you come on up and um, uh, set your computer up? 
Actually, maybe since we're having glitches on the computer, maybe I'll just do it individually instead. So, but anyway, you, you set up and then uh, let me get this out of the way. Uh, our first speaker is Rob Wood. Uh, he's the Charles River Professor at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and is a founding is a founding core faculty member of the Wiese Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Rob's the founder of the Harvard Microrobotics Lab, which leverages expertise in microfabrication for the development of biologically inspired robots, and his current research interests include new microscale manufacturing techniques, fluid mechanics, flapping wings, control of sensor limited, and computational in computation limited systems, active soft materials, and morphable soft bodied robots. Uh, he's won many, many awards, uh, which I won't uh, list here, but uh, one is the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, which he received from President Obama uh, for his work in microrobotics. So Rob, why don't you? So thank you, Chuck, and thank you to the GSD for, uh, for sponsoring this event. This is very exciting for me to be a part of this. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, topics of my work that sort of mesh thematically with what uh, Chuck was saying about informal robotics. In particular, I'm going to tell you a lot about uh, things that we do that involve uh, new ways to build robots. And so we're very much, uh, maybe without uh, at risk of uh, getting a little bit too philosophical here, we're, our group um, is very much on the sort of mechanical side of AI, meaning not thinking about uh, you know, how a robot can reason about its environment and then act on it, more along the lines of how do we develop new hardware, new, new capabilities for the physical instantiation of the robot. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, uh, I'm going to step backwards a little bit, even, even farther back than Chuck did, and, and start to uh, give you my uh, sort of very, very informal history of robotics. And so just to get everybody calibrated, if we start back, uh, back in the 1920s when the word robot was actually conceived, it was part of uh, a play by a Czech playwright called Rossum's Universal Robots, which apparently was not a very good play. but. Uh, but, but nonetheless brought the, brought the term into existence. Um, people are probably very familiar with Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis uh, in the dy sort of dystopic view of, of these uh, you know, robots interacting with humans and perhaps even in slightly more contemporary is uh, the, the, I Ro the uh, robot series by Asimov. And of course the theme here is that, uh, that uh, you know, robots and humans mixed together, then that's, that's not a good thing. Then you get this uh, sort of dystopic view uh, of the world. Um, what I, I would prefer to think about this sort of the fantastical sense of robots and sort of ground it with some of the the, the key contributions, if you will, in, in, in the history of robotics. One is is my, one of my favorites is, is Voyager One. So this was taken oh, I can't can't even remember now several, you know billion miles away from Earth, looking back and 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 sort of giving sort of a sense of gravity to uh, you know to the accomplishments of the Voyager program and, and human curiosity. This is another one, which is the Curiosity rover on Mars. And really speaks to the you know the the pinnacle of of human exploration and, and technologies. But if I were to then take think about where I see you know robotics on a daily basis, chances are that everybody in this room has been uh, is either wearing something or has eaten something today or some other way that a robot has has touched your lives uh, on a day to day basis. And they're typically environments like this. And so Chuck showed this a little bit, and I'm sure Connor will mention this a little bit as well. But the thing that you don't see in this in these environments is is people right and, and that's that's quite simply because these are are meant to be rigid fast uh, precise powerful and, and that sort of precludes them from interacting in, a, in an effective way with humans directly maybe this is a more uh, more maybe a, a sort of counterexample to ways that, uh, that that these robots might interact with humans but but what really um, excites us in our research are, are several sort of basic things. Uh, for this sort of mechanical side of AI, we look to, to nature for inspiration. Uh, we also look for, to other non, non sort of intuitive or non sort of traditional places, and this is what I'm going to talk about both bio inspired robotics and then new ways to build uh, these, these robot systems. And I'm, I'm basically going to, I'm not going to get too deep into any one of them, but I'm just going to give you a bunch of examples of the types of robots that are sort of coming out of our research in this area. So, one is um, uh, one theme will be uh, how how we can make um, new new robots. What, what are we motivated to do to build uh, new mechanical systems that uh, that that constitute these small ro that, these robots? And one of the motivations is well, if we want to make something like this, 
uh, or let's say the mechanical analog of this, then we're going to confront really difficult challenges in how do we construct the, the fundamental components of these devices. And so we thought about this, we've been thinking about this for about 15 years now, of what are the, what are the viable tech candidate technologies to do these types of things. And it turns out that there's you know, this spectrum of, of sort of physical sizes that we can think about these robots existing on. And at the very smallest end of the, of the spectrum, uh, we have things like integrated circuit derived processes for building like micro, microelectromechanical systems, things that, that are sort of commonplace now but have only recently been been sort of you know ubiquitous. Um, but but things that are made. This is a, this is an extremely outdated uh, uh, example now. This is a Texas Instruments DLP projection system which consists of a 1080p array of individually addressable mirrors. Uh, but it gives you a, sort of an idea of you know one one end of the spectrum of you know highly parallelizable. Uh, very fine feature sizes, uh, you, know, are, you know, articulated devices, but it also illustrates uh, some of the things that we want to overcome, which is, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about mostly two-dimensional processes here, things that are either surface or bulk, bulk micromachining techniques are going to be really limiting you to sort of quasi-two-dimensional devices, two-and-a-half-dimensional devices. And the thing which is a little bit more subtle is that these techniques um, for building these devices are going to take, you know, we're talking about time constants that are on the order of months. And what we really want to do, which is, uh, which is really um, pronounced in, in what Chuck is doing in his class, we want to be able to you know, conceive of a, of a need or even just a design and then be able to turn that into a reality in the course of you know, hours, if not minutes. Not talking about uh, you know not talking about months and so how can we develop tools that allow us to do that and of course on the larger end of the spectrum there's the more nuts and bolts approach and and I could argue that you know you don't want to really do you don't want to build complex systems especially at small scales you know using this sort of you know thousands of arbitrarily shaped components you know manually assembled etc. Now I'm going to contradict myself because this is the nuts and bolts approach. This is the way that we used to, to build these types of devices, which is, uh, which is just as you see, you're, you're, you're piecing together pieces of these components. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the, the term for this is graduate student with tweezers approach, uh, which is an extremely, um, it's extremely tedious, it's difficult to do, it takes quite a lot of skill, and, and, and it really makes these things sort of, you know, one-off, you know, pieces which uh, are very precious in their designs. You don't, you don't really, you know, if, there, if it takes three months to get up to speed and then, you know, a month to build one of these devices, you're not going to be very, uh, you know, you're going to be very conservative in your designs that you explore, which is, which is what we want to avoid. And so we, we um, in our research, uh, in this aspect of our research, uh, we, if, if I could be so bold, we took inspiration from Richard Feynman's famous uh, uh, speech from uh, the 1950s where he gave a talk about there's plenty of room at the bottom where he described small robots making other small robots, uh, you know, massive parallelization by, by leveraging sort of the economies of scale when you go down, you know, these, these, these tiny, tiny robots um, starting building replicas of themselves. And he really sort of was, was uh, prophetic when he was talking about you know the 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 ability to to leverage things like MEMS or other related microfabrication technologies that could that are that are inherently parallelizable, and so we took this um, sort of literally. Uh, this is the way that we build some of our robots now, where you take this approach where, as opposed to having individual pieces of the robots being assembled manually under a microscope, for example, instead we we make robots that make robots. And this is this is sort of an example of this where the robot you want to build is in the middle and it's got wings and actuators and it doesn't really matter what it is, but then um, they have to be sort of very, very precisely pieced relative to each other. How do we do this? Well, we built a, a, a robot, if you will, around it, an assembly scaffold around it, which by the nature of this assembly scaffold uh, controls all the trajectories that are built into the assembly of these devices. And by very simple actuation in this case, um, the, these are allowed to sort of pop up into place and, uh, and, and form the complex structures that you see. So we, we, call, this, uh, we, we call this general process um, uh, we, we, well, pop up pop up process pop up book mems for example uh, just by just for its allusion to uh, to children's pop up books and the sort of fantastically complicated structures that you can create using these with very simple inputs you know I'm just pushing on something or pulling on something or opening something and by virtue of the of the coupling of all of these motions to more complex motions I can get these these uh, complicated devices so here's a few other things that we can build so that's one I just showed you this is uh, I'll just run through a few uh, few quick examples. Um, of uh, this is something which is going to unfold, uh, which is a, a, a one, uh, I can't remember the scale now, one 200th scale or one something like that scale version of the, of the 1903 Wright Flyer. Um, we can make all sorts of other things like, you know, composite chains and, um, 
massive parallelization just by arraying these things in the plane. I'm not really telling you how these are made. I can tell you in, in more detail if you're interested, but it, it parallels in a lot of the ways the, the, uh, the work that's done uh, in Chuck's class. So, um, you know, approximation, this is another relatively complicated example where I'm approximating a sphere using a 20-sided regular polygon, an icosahedron, uh, where, the, again, there's an assembly scaffold which is forming the, uh, the, the central structure, which is the icosahedron in the center there. Um, we can make things that are self-assembling, so things which are under pre-stress, which then once you, once you release them, they pop themselves up. This is a, a uh, millimeter uh, on a side uh, hexagonal prism. Um, make little little legged robots that I'll show you in a minute, um, and, and a whole host of other things, the sensors and such. I'm, I'm not going to get too much into detail of that. So, so here's, uh, here, here's one example of the things we can make. This is one of the original motivations for doing these types of things, which is the creation of these uh, robotic insects. And so um, we published a few years ago that we could actually make these things and fly them around. Um, we do this in this very controlled environment that we have in our lab, and I'll just show you some highlights of that. So these are these robots, and this is how well they work if you uh, just turn them on, which is not, not very well at all. They are, uh, the, the scale here is, is just about the same as a house fly or a, or a, or a, or a honeybee, I guess. And, uh, and, and the, one of the motivations for building these things is that we want to build extremely agile robots. Um, and so this is, this is one of the reasons these things are sort of you know, tumbling off in, into space here is because they're extremely open loop unstable. So they're very, the agility of these natural flyers comes from the fact that in the absence of active control, they're unstable. And so once you figure out a way, oh, this is what it looks like in real time, by the way. So they're very, very fast. So this is a sequence of actually a se sequence of trimming flights where we start to learn some of the dynamics of these systems. And then if you understand them correctly, you can actively stabilize these things. You can get them to fly around. All of this is tethered and, and offboard power and control which is the subject of our current work, which I'm not going to talk about. But you can get these things to do pretty, uh, pretty interesting things, pretty aggressive aerobatic maneuvers. Um, this one is, uh, this is there's, a, there's several things that are happening here. One is the fact that, uh, you know, this is trial eight. Uh, the first seven trials failed and crashed miserably, but it doesn't really matter. As you saw before, they survived these crashes. And you can learn from the dynamics of these systems from, from failed attempts and do really interesting things. Uh, this is another one where we're landing on natural, uh, natural structures. So, so, okay, so we can do that with flying things. We can, using the same processes, and you can kind of get out, maybe this one might be a little bit of a better example, you can kind of make out that, that uh, again, starting from these flat laminated structures, you can create these pretty complicated robots. Uh, in this case, this is a running robot, which happens to be one of the fastest robots on Earth, of course, if you, only if you normalize to body length. Um, and in fact, it happens to be uh, you know, much faster than Usain Bolt if you do that. Uh, but the point is, again, you can create these highly dynamic robots that are just the consequence of the fact that we can build, build in arbitrary materials, high performance actuators. We can, we can pack in uh, you know, highly, highly dense electronics uh, and, and power systems in, in, into these devices and create things that are, you know, again, they're highly dynamic uh, just by nature of the, the materials and the designs that we can achieve with these things. Uh, here's another example of, uh, oh, and we can, we can make these things autonomous and, you know, pack in. We can use these basically as test beds for uh, things we might want to do eventually with the little flying robots. Uh, this is another example which kind of highlights the, uh, the parallel, parallel uh, assembly uh, capabilities of this process. This, is, this was something to create a, a myriapod, a centipede-like uh, robot. Um, the, a, lot of, um, lot, a lot of what uh, I'm not having time to tell you about is that, so um, as Chuck was describing a lot of these robots, a lot of, a lot of new uh, and exciting research in robotics is bio-inspired. Uh, and what it turns out is that if you can start to create structures which in some way mimic the, the structure or function of the natural systems, you can start to flip that arrow of bioinspiration and start to use these things to test out hypotheses in, in the robotic system that would be difficult to test out with the animal. It's much, much easier to do controlled experiments with robotics than it is with animals. And so we, this, was, this was the point of this robot as well. I won't get too deep into that. Um, this is another related work, uh, again, using the same manufacturing process, but now uh, to build little jumping robots. It turns out that um, some of our collaborators figured out how fleas jump and, and, and sort of approximated mechanisms that, that mimic this sort of latching mechanism in fleas. And then uh, also we're simultaneously observing water striders jumping off the surface of water in an escape response and realize that uh, some of the same mechanisms are happening there, but how do they do this with, with, how do they actually jump on the surface of water? It turns out they figured out that just so long as you, you know, 
don't have a rapid impact like you would be jumping on land, it turns out that you can, uh, you, you can impart uh, pretty large forces on the surface of water and the water acts like a spring. Uh, and, and so this is a pretty cool thing that, uh, that, that they published in science uh, this past summer. So you can jump on the surface of water, not just walk, not just run, but jump. Um, okay, then the last you know, two minutes that I'll tell you about is, um, uh, so, so a really exciting uh, set, of, set of work, which is arguably uh, the most uh, related to what Chuck has been describing, which is now not thinking about alternative manufacturing motiv motivated by size or performance per se, but thinking about alternative methods to build things which are motivated by accessibility and low cost. So how can, you know, can, I, can I create this sort of infrastructure for this concept of informal robotics? And before Chuck coined the term in, uh, formal ro uh, uh, informal robotics, we called this several things. So we called this uh, programmable matter. Uh, this was a work that uh, that we did with some collaborators, uh, Daniela Roos, Eric Demain, uh, and, and and others at MIT, uh, a number of years ago, where uh, we're using a repeated fold pattern and locally embedded actuators to create. And this the concept here was create reconfigurable shapes that could, could attain arbitrary structure. Now these are relatively simple shapes, which are a boat and a plane, but sort of illustrates that concept. Another term that we um, that we used, excuse me, another term that we, uh, that we used for these uh, devices, for these types of devices, are uh, printable robots. Um, and so this is, uh, this is an example of, again, of a collaboration that we have with MIT and, and, and now UPenn, of taking the concept of, of printable, not, not in a literal sense, but in a sort of metaphorical sense where we're thinking about um, you know, accessibility. So using tools which are, are ubiquitous, you know, simple, you know, wax printers and, 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 you know, relatively inexpensive laser cutters and etch tanks and these sort of things. And creating robots, again, by, by sort of 2D processes and then folding. And so uh, you can create pretty functional devices doing this, and, and there's plenty outside. I won't belabor this, but uh, here's an example of robots that are playing chess. That was an illegal move, um, but that, that's okay. They don't, they don't, they're, they're not quite smart yet. Um, but, but you can create you know, somewhat functional robots doing this, uh, uh, using this process. The, uh, now, what the thing that gets us excited several things that get us, get us excited about this, but one of them is the following. If I start to think about robots like you're showing in, in the bottom here, um, they can quickly get pretty complicated. And so the idea is you want to make this easy and accessible, and I've got these processes which basically give me recipes for how to make them, but then I have somebody fold it up by hand, then it, gets, it can be pretty, uh, pretty skill-based. And so we've put some effort into um, developing what we call shape memory composites, which are basically these, these flat composites again, consisting of very simple materials, cardboards, uh, in, in this case is a shape memory polymer, which is a fancy word for shrinky dinks. Uh, and so we can create these devices, locally heat them, transition a phase, uh, trigger a phase transition and cause uh, localized folding to create these arbitrary, arbitrarily complex structures uh, automatically uh, without human intervention. So. I specifically said arbitrarily complex because that's what we want to do. We want to create very complex machines that utilize these techniques. And so we worked with uh, Eric Demain and, and Daniela Roos and others at MIT who um, are experts in, tell, in, in, in figuring out, you know, what are, what are some, you know, sort of basic building blocks that we would need to develop and demonstrate to claim that we can make more or less arbitrary structures, arbitrarily complex mechanisms and structures. And so this is a robot that we made which starts flat, folds itself up, and walks away. The robot itself is not particularly impressive, but the interesting thing to us is that it embeds the key aspects of what I just said of these building blocks, uh, which I, I can't tell you what they are, but the, that embeds all of the, the required things like uh, single edge vertex folds, mountain valley folds, et cetera, things which would allow you to sort of build upon that uh, and, and make more complicated structures. So I think I'm out of time, so I'll just say thanks, and I'm happy to go any deeper into this uh, either uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the session, in the question sessions, or, or afterwards. Thanks. thanks. So uh, hopefully you're getting a, a little bit of a sense of why I've gotten so excited about, about this field. Um, our next speaker is uh, Connor Walsh. Connor is Assistant Professor of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at uh, Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and is a core faculty member at the Wies Institute as well. Uh, Con Connor is the founder of the Harvard Biodesign Lab, which brings together researchers from the engineering, industrial design, apparel, clinical, and business communities to, ve to develop new technologies and translate them uh, to industrial partners. 
His research focuses on applying disruptive technologies to the development of robotic devices for augmenting and restoring human performance. So, uh, Connor, why don't you come up and show us what you're up to. Thanks. So, um, thanks, Chuck, for the introduction. Um, so, I've been an assistant professor here at Harvard in the School of Engineering and a core faculty member at the Wies Institute for the last four years, approximately. Um, I live down Cambridge Street and I walk by the GSD every day on the way to work. It's my first time inside, so thank you, Chuck, for making that happen. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in, and taking a new approach to developing robots where the basic premise is, you know, when you think about wearable robots or exoskeletons, people usually think about these systems giving people superhuman strength where they give very large levels of assistance. But we're basically thinking about can you, you know, develop systems that give small to moderate levels of assistance but through very lightweight, conformal and unobtrusive uh, structures. So when I was a graduate student at MIT, I worked with Professor Hugh Burr on one of these rigid exoskeletons. And, you know, I think you can see firsthand that I don't look particularly happy wearing that device. Um, but basically, I, I experienced firsthand the challenges of, you know, these types of systems where, you know, it's hard to align the robotic joints with the biological joints. There's added mass, and that inertia kind of changes how you walk. Um, and the kinematic restrictions really mean, mean that you walk in a very unnatural type of way. So, you know, we successfully showed that this exoskeleton could transfer 80%, 85% of the load from a backpack, so about 80 pounds, and the device down to the ground. We measured that with some sensors. But basically, it made it 11% harder to walk. So instead of an exoskeleton, we create an exercise machine. And, you know, this was really one of the, the first times that people had tried this approach. We were using springs and other things to try and make it very low power. But I think Hugh would also admit that using this type of approach, it's very, very challenging to augment how healthy people can, can move and walk. So Rob kind of alluded to this, but you can see here that the reason we went in that direction before, and a lot of other groups did as well, is that, you know, um, robotic technologies were originally designed and optimized for here. And what you don't see in this picture are people. You see yellow cages protecting people from the robots. And so in, in our group, we really have tried to take a new approach and move away from an exoskeleton to something that we call an exosuit. And this is basically a vision of our system shown here. This is a DARPA-funded project, and you know, the initial goal is to try and help healthy people, soldiers carrying heavy loads, be able to walk with less effort. So reduce the amount of oxygen that they need to consume when walking. And there's a bunch of different areas that we focus on. So textiles is a big part of it. I'll talk a little bit about that today. And we work on actuation schemes where we can put the motors and batteries and the heavy components near the person's center of mass because they're very efficient at carrying weight there. And compared to on the legs, if you put you know, the same weight down here, it makes it very hard to walk. And we work in control systems. So we have a bunch of different sensors that detect the movement of the person, the interaction forces between the device and the robot. So you can actually monitor what the person is doing, and then a microprocessor can tell the robot when to apply assistance to the, to the person. And we do a lot of testing. We call our, our development approach basically human in the loop or patient in the loop, where every week we're testing prototypes, designs, controllers on people and seeing how they respond, because really the human is an intimate part of, of these devices and machines. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd just show that, you know, this is really a multidisciplinary project, and this isn't everyone who works on it, but this is just one slide that kind of highlights that, you know, you've got people with mechanical design and actuation experience, electrical engineering experience, you know, medical experience, and textile sensor experience, and biomechanics experience, and controls and algorithm development experience. And it's really an interesting mix of people that we've tried to put together under the one roof um, that really work together to tackle the various different aspects of this system. And I, I'm going to focus a lot on the design aspect today, given the audience and, and this forum. Um, but we spend a lot of time you know, really doing some hardcore and um, technical robotics work um, as well. Um, so, um, this is an overview of a, you know, a slightly dated version of our system, but the basic premise is you've got these two actuator units. The whole system weighs about 6.5 kilograms, so about 12 pounds or 13 pounds. There's nothing inside the backpack. The backpack is what a soldier would normally carry, and these units go on the side of the backpack. Then you can see cables transmit forces down to different parts of the suit and to the textiles, and we have sensors, a gyroscope to measure movement, and a load cell to measure force. Um, and so that's kind of the basic architecture of the system. And I'll explain a little bit how it works. So it's really quite simple in concept. You've got various textile components that need to anchor to different parts of the body. So in this case here, um, a waist belt and a tie brace. And then you, know, you have an actuator unit and a Bowden cable, like a bike brake cable. 
and that can anchor dis uh, proximal and distal to that joint, in this case the hip joint, and pull those two parts together, um, generating an assistive torque um, at the joint. And so basically when that shortens, it's basically applying a force um, in parallel with what, what the underlying muscles in the leg are doing. So basically it's a kind of bio-inspired approach as well, where we're trying to say which muscles should we try and help, and then adding these tension elements, these actively um, tensioning elements on the outside of the body that couple to the body through the textile components. Um, a cool thing is that you can actually have this be truly mechanically transparent to the wearer. So you can have the cable go slack, and it means that the person really doesn't feel anything. They just feel like they're walking normally or wearing a pair of pants. And that's something that would be very hard to do with a traditional type of robotic system. Um, we have, you know, this video here just illustrates the way that the suit actually pulls. So what you can see here, this is actually the force sensor, the load cell, that's measuring the force that's being applied to the person. And you see the cable is pulling these two different points together. Um, on the suit. So we actually have a multi-joint system. I won't go into too much detail today, but essentially what we're doing for the military project is assisting the hip um, extensors, the hip flexors, as well as the ankle plantar flexors, because we know from biomechanics literature that these are the muscles that use the most energy when people are walking um, on level ground. So that's really the muscles that we decided to, to target. So we spent a lot of time on textiles in the lab and working on the different suit components. And you can kind of see a kind of rough evolution. This is, you know, about a year ago we got to about here, so we've got a little bit further. And, but, you know, we started off with very crude prototypes. We had one sewing machine in the lab. And, but you can kind of see how we've gradually iterated the design through kind of an understanding of how, you know, some principles about how you attach the body, and I'll mention some of them in a little bit. Um, but also kind of through a lot of user testing. So, you know, people test it, feel it, wear it, um, and understand, you know, is it restricting motion? It does it feel comfortable? So that human testing part is really a critical part of the work. And so we've had to build up a lot of expertise. And when I started a robotics research group four years ago, I definitely didn't envision that we would be doing things to this level that we are today, but that's where we've ended up. And so Diana Wagner, who I think is here, um, uh, Tiffany Wong and Rachel, who I also saw, um, you know, are really spearheading our efforts in this area where, you know, these are people with a functional apparel design background, you know, and maybe done masters at RISD or done training in textiles or fashion. And, you know, having these people to be able to work alongside the mechanical engineers, the electrical engineers, and we have a room that used to be an office space, but now we have, I think, five different sewing machines of different sizes and shapes um, inside there. We're you know, starting to work on more software to try and understand how do you drape these types of um, textiles around people to design the patterns. Um, and then we work with partners to try and produce these systems as well. And um, so you know, I think it's really interesting. And you know, uh, for the discussion part, I'd love to you know, get questions from people about you know, how does this fit in with you know, efforts here at the GSD. It's very similar to some of the stuff Rob was talking about, but in, instead we're using textile components. Um, so this is kind of an overview of, you know, an older version of the suit where you can see, you know, there's a waist belt component um, that uses basically some, you know, has some flexible regions and also some um, inextensible regions. Um, you know, we have a spandex base layer because you don't want to have the suit rub or chafe on a person because that is un uncomfortable. We have different brace components that attach to, you know, I mentioned the waist, the tie, and, and some other um, straps that kind of anchor around the calf. So we're basically trying to figure out how do we comfortably anchor to different parts on the body, because you need to be able to do that to then generate tension across a joint. So one of the really interesting things is that the, there's a lot of compliance in the system. So, you know, people are squishy. We're all squishy to various different degrees. Um, and you can see that the, you know, the, this person, you know, when you pull on the suit, you know, compresses. Um, the textile materials stretch. Some of the cables also stretch. And really all of that compliance um, is really a very important factor because it affects you know, how you have, what type of motors you have to use, how quickly you have to pull. And this is just one video that kind of illustrates that. So someone's just standing in this pose and we're pulling down here at the ankle joint. And you can see how the, the textile components um, you know, are, are stretching and straining a little bit. The soft tissue is compressing. And so we kind of call, we call this the effective suit human stiffness. So it's kind of an effective term that you can kind of lump together. And so we're gradually trying to understand, you know, and, and take a systematic approach to understanding what contributes to that. You know, is it the raw material so we can test them in an Instrom machine? Is it the Bowden cables? Is it the textile components so we can put them on a mannequin? But then we can also test the suit, the components on a person and take the human compliance also into that. So we're trying to understand you know, um, what are some good evaluation methods? So when we design new suit components, we actually know have we designed something that is better than the previous, the previous version. 
So this is just illustrating you know, how we use the, what we call, we've defined structured functional textiles. So the textiles actually have a structure to them where we actually think about what's the load path going through the textiles. So if we're anchoring you know, this waist belt and we're pulling here with a cable, how do those forces get transferred up to you know, good anchor points on the body? So your waist belt and your iliac crest is a good anchor point. And we use the conical sections of the, the thigh and the calf as well. And also the foot is another good anchor point. So we spend a lot of time really thinking about the different materials and how we choose them in order to achieve the function that we want with these systems. And this is kind of just illustrating it here. I mentioned that already. But then we also think about what's the appropriate way to route these components around the leg so that you don't restrict a person's natural movement, but you can kind of keep the load path as short as possible so that you basically minimize the amount of compliance in the system. Um, and then, you know, basically also trying to think about making sure that we have some of these um, fabric areas wide enough so that you don't get very high pressure points because that can cause a lot of discomfort for the wearer. So using all of this, you know, one of the ways that we evaluate this, and I think this is still you know, a lot of work in progress, is we, we measure the displacement. So this is the amount here, this is the amount that this cable displaces measured with an encoder, and the force that's produced and measured with a load cell. So that's kind of an effect of stiffness. So this huge suit human effect of stiffness. So basically using these techniques, we've been gradually able to kind of improve that and getting a higher stiffness. So when you pull, the suit doesn't move a lot. It's basically as stiff as possible. And we've basically been able to improve that quite a lot um, over the years through different materials and different designs that allow the system to be more conformal to the wearer. Um, we're also starting to actually measure the pressure that the suit is exerting on the person. So we can actually you know, get some arrays of pressure measuring um, devices, put them between the suit and the person and try and see are there some hot spots and then use that as a way to kind of guide the design of the suit um, components. So more recently, we've been working with New Balance, which has been you know, quite exciting. We've learned a, an awful lot from them. Um, so you can see here that we've had to develop multiple sizes of systems because we have to test these on you know, lots of different people, soldiers, graduate students, um, and postdocs. So you can see that there's five different components. There's a waist belt component for our latest suit. There's a tie brace, a calf wrap, some connecting straps, and a base layer. And so we've you know, really had to think about how do you actually grade these components so that you can scale them to different body shapes and sizes. And we're, so I think software in the future you know, will, does play a role in industry, but in our lab is going to play a much bigger role in terms of how we can do this very efficiently. So once you design one pattern, you can scale it very easily to different body shapes and sizes. Um, this is just showing some improvements. Basically, you can see before we were using seatbelt webbing because it's very inextensible, but it's also not very conformal and it's also quite heavy. So, you know, working with New Balance, we identified different types of materials. So some very lightweight laminates that can be very stiff and inextensible, but still quite conformal. And we can actually integrate these into a textile um, to basically create a new type of material that kind of suits the needs of our applications. And um, so that's kind of really, there's a lot of innovation gone in, you know, to the, you know, kind of architecture of these suits, not necessarily in the materials themselves, but in how we combine them in, in interesting ways. So I thought I'd show a few, a, uh, a few cool videos. So this is just kind of, you can hear the sound if you turn it up maybe a little bit. And that's the robotic assistance in sync with his gait. And you can see that, you know, because you can have the system be really transparent, you can apply assistance and then basically step over obstacles, step stop up. very quickly. Step in. And then you can see that the system can automatically detect that the person is walking again and the motors can you know, continue to apply assistance, but it basically gets out of the way the rest of the time when you're not walking. And we're starting to do more and more testing outside, right? So we're actually, some of the team are at the army at the moment, testing these systems on soldiers, but we actually go out to the Fells Way um, north of Boston, and you can see here that, you know, this is Kieran, he's a graduate student in the lab who's been on the project for the last year, um, walking around, and you can basically see what this graph is showing these are the forces at the hip and ankle. So you can see that when he's walking, even outside in this type of rough terrain, it's still applying you know, pretty consistent forces to him as he's walking and moving around. And what this is showing in the middle, if he was to step over an obstacle like this, basically the suit can detect that and it doesn't apply forces when you're doing that other type of gait event. I'll just let this video play to the end because you'll kind of see that we realized when we were out at the Fells way that there's, you know, this dog seems to like the system quite a lot. So. <laughs> so I, I doubt Kieran knew he was signing up for that when he joined my lab as a graduate student.
but I think if we if we stop the sound on the other video and this video here on the right, you can basically see the cable is basically like fed out by the robotic system. So normally it's pulling here to assist with hip extension, but then it can detect you know that he's about to step over an obstacle and feed out that cable so that it doesn't actually get in the way of him while he's walking. So we do a lot of testing on people, and the biomechanics and physiology aspect of this work is also critical. And we have a very nice facility at the Wies Institute. We have a nice motion capture lab there. So we monitor the movement of the person with reflective markers, muscle activity, um, as well as um, oxygen consumption um, also. So I, I won't go into too much detail other than to say recently we've had quite an exciting result that shows that actually when you wear the system and carry the 6.5 kilograms, you can actually make it more efficient to walk wearing the system um, than not wearing it. So it's about 7% easier to walk wearing the device versus not wearing it. So we're the third group in the world you know, to show that. Basically two other groups showed that last year. But it's been one of the grand challenges in wearable robotics. Can you actually make healthy people walk more efficiently. So that's kind of an exciting result, and I think we'll be able to do a lot better in the future. So I'll transition a little bit on for the remainder of the talk to how we're also applying the same type of technology to medical applications. So you may or may not be aware, but the field of wearable robots is exploding at the moment. There's a number of companies developing very exciting systems that are targeted at people who are fully paralyzed. So these people can't walk, but now they're able to walk with these you know, rigid exoskeletons. But there's a whole host of other people out there who have some residual walking capacity, i.e. they can walk, they just can't walk very well. And stroke is one example in, in pathology where, where patients suffer that. So fundamentally, we don't feel that this type of system is, is best suits the needs of these people. So what we've been doing is developing a lightweight and soft exosuit that's targeted um, at the impaired leg of stroke patients to be able to give small to moderate levels of assistance to help restore their walking capacity to more normal levels. And Kathleen O'Donnell, um, she's an industrial designer in the lab um, who's basically kind of leading this effort and really thinking about kind of, you know, the, the end users and designing a system for them. So I'll show a few quick videos. You can see here on the left, the system is, is not powered and on the right it's powered, and you can basically see that the person has a much more natural looking gait. Um, the next video um, shows um, another um, patient walking where you can see normally they walk with a cane, so they're holding on quite tightly, but then when the assistance is applied, they're basically barely touching the handrail because they feel a lot more stable and this suit is providing that assistance. And then one of the cool things is we also think that the system is going to be able to help um, you know, people walk faster and be able to walk longer distances as well with this type of technology. So that's on the lower extremity. I'll briefly touch base on some work that we're doing on the upper extremity. We're using some alternative soft robotic techniques to develop um, gloves to assist people with activities of daily living. And um, so we're basically targeting people who have the, um, lost the ability to grasp objects very well. So there's a wide variety of different impairments, stroke, um, spinal cord injury, ALS, muscular dystrophy. And so when I came to Harvard, Rob and George Whitesides were doing some really cool work on soft robotics, and we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we integrated this into a glove? Um, so basically, what we're, the goal is, can we actually create customized, disposable, wearable robots that are tailored to the needs of people by basically rapidly creating you know, different designs that match the needs of, of each person? And so these actuators are you know, silicon actuators that use different reinforcements um, to add constraints so that when you pressurize them with air or water, they can take these cool different types of motions. And so one of the, the things that we realized is that you could actually create a multi-segment actuator where you program it mechanically to have a motion similar to the thumb, for instance, or one of the fingers. And that's what's shown here. So this is just one actuator but basically you pressurize it, so one input, and you can get this complex output motion that really mimics kind of the natural behavior, and that would be very hard to achieve with a, a traditional type of robotic system. So this is one lady who we visited. She basically had zero grasp strength. It's hard to see, but she could register zero on this scale. And then we brought you know, an early prototype of the glove out to her, and we basically just inflated it with bicycle pumps because that was our first step you know, to be safe as engineers, oh my goodness. but you can Look kind of see her reaction. You know, this is, you know, wow. the first time she sees her, you know, two digits coming together to allow her amazing? to kind of grasp um, oh objects. Oh my goodness, I can pinch something. And so we've developed a better prototype. You know, this is continuously evolving projects. And this video kind of just shows a, a quickly um, a demonstration of how it can actually assist her during functional tasks. So she has a hard time grasping objects and a hard time letting go of objects. But you can see once the glove is on, she's able to perform this you know, much better than she was able to previously. And this is still a pretty early prototype. We want to make it lighter, slimmer, maybe not black. Um, 
Um, but I think it, it, it's you know, exciting to see that using these types of lightweight systems, you can actually really improve the ability of people to perform functional tasks. So I just thought I'd finish by giving a shout out to some work. We're also launching this initiative called the Soft Robotics Toolkit, where basically if you go to www.softroboticstoolkit.com, um, this is an effort with Donald Holland, who's um, been here at SEAS and is now at University College Dublin in Ireland. You can basically download a lot of the materials um, that we've developed in the labs here at Harvard um, and in other universities across the world. And we have some competitions that we've launched and we'll launch competitions again over this next year. It'd be great to have some teams from the GSD enter where we basically encourage people to use the material that we've put online or that other people have put online um, to develop new cool soft robots. Um, and so some people have developed new sensing actuators and some crawling robots. But my personal favorite is there was a high school student in Missouri who developed the, the teddy bear that hugs back. So, you know, you basically hug this robot and you squeeze it. It pressurizes these actuators and then they wrap around you and give you a hug back. And I was like, that's genius. Um, but there's been a lot of people who have helped with the, the work that we've done, you know, in the lab and collaborators and funding sources. I'm happy to take questions during the, the panel session. Thanks. Great. I think that, that um, uh, Connor's talk really uh, kind of exemplifies the, the way that uh, the conception uh, of these devices is just like kind of an engine for innovation. And uh, there's also just something that's like fantastically uh, kind of intimate about, uh, you know, what we think of normally as uh, kind of a very uh, sort of uh, cold technology, uh, but when it's brought into contact with a human body. Um, our third speaker is Rob McCurdy. Uh, Rob is, uh, I've known Connor and Rob Wood for a while, but Rob and I uh, just met recently. Uh, he's a, he's a postdoctoral associate in Daniela Roos's distributed robotics lab at MIT. And Rob's developing new additive manufacturing, a new mat additive manufacturing process that's called printable hydraulics uh, that incorporates liquids into 3D printed parts as they're built, allowing hydraulically actuated robots to be automatically fabricated. Rob did his PhD work, with, PhD work with Hod Lipson at Cornell, where he developed materials and methods that demonstrated systems capable of automatically printing functional electromechanical devices with the goal of printing robots that literally walk out of the printer. So Rob, come on up. And, uh, thanks. All right, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. All right, so yeah, the title is Multicellular Machines. And if you'll bear with me, I think in about five or six slides, I'll actually show you what I mean by that. So um, let me start by talking about what some of the robots that I think are really noteworthy recently, the PackBot, Atlas, and, uh, and others. You know, there are these ubiquitous quadcopters now. And the reason that I'm showing them is both because I think that they're amazing, but also I want to highlight the countless hours of development and expertise that went into designing and creating and fabricating each of these things. So their creators became subject experts in control theory and in um, creating a better actuator and in finding just the best sensor. So you have to have this amazing uh, domain knowledge across a broad spectrum of domains in order to become successful in actually making these devices. And so each of them, as I said, took a really long time to develop. So people have been trying to come up with ways of accelerating that development, maybe by leveraging modules. Um, so yeah, I think I talked about some of these things, the fabrication, design space, et cetera. So in summary, yeah, just an incredible design development effort. So standardization occurred about 25 years ago, occurred uh, as a solution to potentially address this problem uh, in the form of modular robots. And so there have been some incredibly noteworthy developments in modular robots. And um, in general, the designers took the strategy of creating one or two module types and then tiling that module across the design space uh, in many cases, they have rotational degrees of freedom. In, in a few cases, there are um, a, a larger subset of modules. So there are wheels and uh, these cubes that are split across the center. But uh, it's safe to say that, in general, they use just one or two module types. So they're impressive, but we have to admit that there are really no applications apart from some, from some toy applications after this two plus decades of development. And I'm kind of personally observing that these modules individually are expensive, they're complex, um, they're relatively large. And so it may be that that's part of the reason that there is none of this proliferation of these things into all these new application spaces. So this is kind of my um, uh, overview slide. And 
I'm proposing that rather than having a few module types, we maybe have a larger number of module types. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe five or ten. I actually don't have an answer for you about the number of module types that we might need. Um, and in particular, these modules could be incredibly simple. So rather than having sensors and actuators and, and batteries that we had in the modules in the module of robots, each module might have just one sort of atomic function in, uh, in, uh, in particular, and then the sum of all these modules used in the robot body creates the functionality that we want. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the simulation tools that I've used and uh, the toolkit of parts that I've developed and then close with some of the means of fabricating uh, complete assemblies, unless you're mechanical assemblies, that we might be able to build with some of these modules. I really want to focus and highlight in this talk that I'm interested in automated assembly and an automated design synthesis. So not all, while some of the things I'm going to show you were not all automated, that's really the goal. So everything that I've been doing has been leading toward that, I, I hope. So I underline fun here because I think that in order to make this thing really take off beyond a few practitioners, we need to have some enthusiasm and, and, uh, and make this a little more accessible. I want to take a poll of the audience. Who here has heard of Minecraft? Okay, and um, how about who, who has used it? Okay, so, so <laughs> I, I won't introduce it, but um, this is a video that I found of a couple of expert Minecrafter users. And what I think is amazing about this is that they're not designing some world that then has a, a beautiful castle or a free-flowing river of lava or something like that. In this case, these designers have kind of hacked Minecraft and used a few specific module types that were, I think they call them firebricks or something. I actually don't play the game, but they, they can transmit a signal from one side of the brick to the other. And so they realize that because there's a delay to that transmission, you can actually use that brick as a prototype for um, electronic circuits. And so they're showing here a dual ALU CPU with memory, um, and, and then they kind of dig into the guts of this whole thing. So they create this amazing universe of a simple, I think, an 8-bit uh, machine effectively, or like, I guess two of them. So what I think is amazing about this is that because Minecraft is so accessible, and it has a simulator which is easy to use, and it gives you predictable output, and I think there's also something to the fact that you're designing in these voxels, which are easy to conceptualize. It's easy for us to think about the physical space that they occupy. I think those things, in sum, make this a really interesting and accessible design space. So it's kind of inspirational, as you'll see. OK, so here's the real title slide and what I mean when I say multicellular machines. So I'm envisioning robots and electromechanical devices more generally that are composed of heterogeneous modules, so maybe you know, 10 or 20 different module types, huge numbers of those modules in assemblies. And these assemblies have to be amenable to automated fabrication and design in order to make those huge numbers of modules actually tractable. Um, I made a few choices in terms of the design. I think that the cellular arrangement, the sort of regular tiling, makes them both easier to design and also tractable to fabricate with, with automation. So let me talk first about simulation. Uh, this was one of the three things that I was going to tell you about. Um, in this case, I, I actually found um, a simulation engine which was developed by a previous member of our lab, which was designed for simulating soft-bodied devices, and uh, adapted that. It was a voxel-based uh, simulator, so adapted that as a simulation engine for designing in this robotic environment. So I started out just hand-designing things, and there are some sort of fun toy examples. This was actually the first thing that I made. And um, I think it's sort of, it was easy for me to imagine how this might move as sort of a quasi-static gate. This was something closer to what I wanted to make, sort of a more organic looking quadruped. But I thought I'd tell you that this tail actually, although it's kind of cute, turns out to be the critical element in this design. So without the tail, the thing doesn't run. It just, it just sort of moves, it's stuck to the floor, which was really frustrating for me. But I'm telling you this because this, even though this is really, really simple, there may be, I think there are 150 voxels in it. And I also forgot to tell you that the colors of the voxels indicate their function. So dark blue voxels are just inert voxels. And then the red and the green voxels are actuation voxels. So they expand and contract out of phase. Anyway, the, um, this, this design environment, even though I, I'm making this argument that by using these voxels, it's a relatively tractable space, it's also a bit counterintuitive. So I think that for this really to scale, uh, in addition to simulation, some design automation tools are going to be 
absolutely critical. And uh, I think that's, again, because I'm imagining millions, if not billions, of these modules. Uh, the fact that they are individually very simplistic means that you have to use them in uh, conjunction with each other in ways that would be potentially counterintuitive. So um, I investigated using evolutionary algorithms potentially as a way of creating these bodies of these different cells. And um, the development process that Drosophila goes through, for example, was kind of an inspiration. In this image, you can see a chemical gradient which is set up during the early developmental processes of this fly. And the concentrations of various chemicals have a determination uh, or partly determine the eventual function of the various portions of the body. And so this observation led us to adapt uh, an algorithm which existed and was applied to making 2D images, and instead to use that algorithm uh, designed by this guy, Ken Stanley, uh, to, make these, to instantiate these 3D bodies. And so the overall process is to evolve a function. This function is, is represented here as this graph. And that function takes the x, y, z position of each voxel and then outputs what the voxel type is going to be, whether it's going to be empty or uh, expansion or contraction or soft or rigid. So let me show you what comes out of that when, uh, when we actually run this, this algorithm. Um, we're using an evolutionary context. We have lots of different individuals which compete against each other for uh, a simple fitness evaluation. In this case, the fitness that we were evaluating was how fast these things could move. And so much to my surprise and delight, we got some things that looked kind of, um, uh, kind of like actual strategies that exist in biology. I think that you could make the argument that this sort of exists also somewhere, and this maybe was sort of like a walrus or something like that. Uh, we got some others that, that I don't think we really thought, this is maybe a little bit of a walker, um, but we found some designs that were really, really surprising to us as well. So I think that's one of the real treats of doing uh, design in this way is that you transform a design space which is potentially incredibly counterintuitive and difficult to, um, to, to kind of wrap your head around uh, into one that where you as a designer can actually choose from a palette of feasible designs. Those designs are feasible based on the objective that you give them. So this is a long video and for time I won't play through it but I'm happy to talk about it later. So um, now I talked about simulation. Now uh, the individual parts that I designed um, this is just sort of a summary slide of, of a whole bunch of different parts that I'm imagining, but uh, we have structural, soft cells, conductive cells, resistors, batteries, logic cells, et cetera. And on the right side, it talks a little bit here about some of the reachable space that each of these cells, when combined together, might allow us to address. Uh, here's some of my artist's conception of what a, a hexapod might look like, and then some actual functional um, electronic cells, in this case with microcontrollers and FETs etc. on them. So it's easy to buy off-the-shelf microcontrollers. Uh, it's not so easy to buy an off-the-shelf micro actuator. So in this case, this is a shape memory alloy actuator that I fabricated using um, microfabrication techniques based on laser. And uh, if you simulate a leg, a 2DOF leg that might use those actuators, it might look something like this shoulder joint. Um, I actually built that, so using four of these actuators we can make a one leg of what might eventually be a, a hexapod, for example. This is a different size scale of one of these modules. Again, this sort of space filling thing. This is what I'm calling the bit blocks material. Uh, and in this case, these bit blocks all attach sort of in a pin and socket approach, which is nice because it allows us to pull them apart, put them back together again, almost like a, an electronic version of Legos. And um, one of the module types in this bit blocks family is a linear actuator. So uh, we can make these sort of simple crawling robots, for example. So I want to move on to the automation uh, of assembly. In this case, using these bit blocks, because they're pin and socket, allows us to use, to, to adapt um, a commercial 3D printer, a gantry style 3D printer, with this special print head, which allows these things to be picked and placed. And if you look closely, you'll see that the printer is also rotating some of these modules as it places them. That's because the functionality of each of these modules is also dependent on the orientation as well as the position within this eventual assembly. So this particular design was a two-channel infrared remote control. And in a second, uh, I'll pick it up and then uh, prove to you that it actually functions as a remote control. So you could imagine uh, you know, sort of printing out a prototype very quickly, uh, using it, and then, and then uh, recycling it and putting it back into your printer. 
So these printers can, of course, be uh, outfitted with feed reels, and the feed reels then can supply these parts in, so you can have an almost unlimited recipe um, or palette of different materials that you can pull into the printer and then uh, assemble into whatever uh, electrical or, as I showed before, ro the, uh, sort of robot uh, function that you want. I'm not sure if you can advance the slide, but I think that the uh, computer might have stalled. OK, great. So I've shown you before some sort of uh, physical blocks, the small little tiny blocks, and then some larger blocks, the things I'm calling the bit blocks. I now want to kind of shift gears a little bit and imagine that uh, depositing a little droplet of liquid takes the place of that physical voxel that I'm depositing before with that pick and place machine. So in this case, uh, I'm proposing using an inkjet head to deposit several different types of voxels down, liquids, uh, rigids, flexibles, support material. And in particular, I want to call your attention to the deposition of liquid. So if you introduce liquid as another material into the palette of a commercially available 3D printer, you can do some interesting things. You can embed liquid channels that never cure solid into a part as it comes out of the printer. So it's ready to use and transmit force via the hydraulic pressure created by that liquid when you push on one side of, uh, in this case, this little bellows device. So I have a, there we go. So three different examples of what you can do when you embed liquid as a functional component inside of this printer. Uh, and so these are just toy examples to kind of highlight the, the capability, but you can imagine uh, connecting a motor to one side of this bellows and then having the other side of this bellows attached to uh, a leg on a robot. Um, similarly, for these flexible robots, you can imagine making flexible grippers, which is in fact what we're working on right now. So um, I think it's an interesting new capability, a new way of having a, a 3D printer create completely functional voxel-based assemblies that are usable right out of the printer with almost no post-processing or fabrication that's necessary. All right, so um, that's it. I'd like to thank uh, some of the funders and take your questions later. Thank you. Um, the discussion was uh, is certainly an important part of this. I know we're running a little bit over. One thing I don't want to forget to remind everyone, and hopefully that will keep you, keep you around, is afterwards we're going to have a reception with uh, sustenance, uh, both liquid and, uh, and solid, I believe, and also with, uh, uh, with substance, because we'll be demonstrating some, uh, some student work uh, in informal robotics. Um, I guess the place I would start, because I think that there's this, um, there's an aspect to these presentations, uh, all of them, that speak to um, kind of a very, very uh, kind of a long horizon uh, for the imagination. Um, and at the same time, there is this uh, incredible level of, um, uh, of, of detail and, 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 and intricacy in terms of, you know, we. we between the three of you, it's kind of, it actually worked out beautifully in terms of, you know, in some ways, Rob foldables and Rob 2 is 3D printing. This is a, like a cartoon version and, 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 uh, and Connor fabric. And so each of you are kind of like going so deep, doing such a deep dive into these materials. And I'm wondering if you could kind of speak about, you know, uh, this tension from the standpoint of, is this, uh, I guess in terms of kind of scalability, uh, like what, um, how does, this obviously is an absolute field of invention, uh, but what is it that would, you know, what, what, what do you see as the breakthroughs that would bring, uh, that, that, that will bring your work into kind of a, say, wider, a wider application that will touch more people? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can give, I don't think it answers the question fully, but I think it maybe stimulates some other discussion. I think, I would guess that in all of our work, you know, we've shown things here, but there is kind of, as well as the embodiment and the invention and the process, there's a lot of knowledge, tips and tricks 
required to actually realize these types of systems. And so one of the questions that we have in the lab is, you know, how would we teach other groups to be able to do what we do? And um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think when you start working with soft materials, foldable materials, textiles, 3D printing, there's like so many parameters that you are tweaking to try and get the performance that you want that you know, it, it's hard to share that, not to say too negative, but I think that's an, an open challenge is how do, you make the, how do you develop design tools that will allow other people to build off you know, the type of work that we've presented. Yeah, and I think uh, along those lines, uh, you know, Connor's group and, and our group have, uh, uh, have, have recognized that and tried to sort of abstract away some of those details. Uh, so one plug is, as uh, Connor was describing, the soft robotics toolkit. Another one is that for uh, Dan Aukis' uh, pop-up CAD. So basically just tools, you know, we can, we can tell you the recipes by which you could, you know, manufacture similar devices. Uh, and I think this is perhaps getting to your question. Um, but that's only one half of the, of the sort of, you know, the, the, the trick there. The other half being um, it's not just the expertise in understanding the materials and understanding the basic components and understanding control theory or whatever is going on with the robot. It's also the, some, some basic knowledge in terms of the design process for these systems, which may be, you know, quite, uh, you know, quite unique to the particular process. I mean, there's no, uh, uh, is, there, is there a Moore's law for any of this where if you could kick it over into another realm. I mean, obviously circuit boards need to be designed, but now we have basically circuit boards designing circuit boards as per sort of the original robotic vision. Is, there, is, 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 is that on the horizon? I understand what you're saying. There's a kind of a social aspect as well to get more people involved with it. But you know, where does, uh, where does it kick over? It's a hard question. Yeah, I guess I could say that um, one, of the, one of the really cool algorithms I think I've seen recently is um, this um, pick Breer algorithm. I'm not sure if anybody here has seen this, but it's basically a way of creating some really cool images completely in an automated way using a little bit of interaction from the, uh, the user. So the user acts basically as a judge, and then pick Breer just evolves uh, these, these different images. And some of the, uh, I think there's actually an online interface for it, so you can do it yourself if you're interested. So, um, I think for me at least, I'm not much of an artist, and I think it'd be really hard for me to create some of these images that Pick Breeder does. And yet, you know, if I could just sit down and in about 15 minutes create something really interesting, it may not be exactly what I had in mind because I think communicating intention is still a major challenge. But I think that design automation tools are, are starting to really advance. And um, to the extent that they encapsulate some of the uh, domain-specific knowledge that's necessary to design these things, I think that will really advance uh, the design of robots and other complex systems. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we, a lot of us take CAD, 3D CAD systems from mechanical design kind of for granted now, right? You just use them, you design parts, you get the machine laser cut. But I think for, for all of these other approaches, there was never the, you know, motivation to develop tools, you know, computational tools for them because people weren't aware that that was an opportunity. So it's basically you d demonstrate something with a new fabrication approach and show, hey, this is actually realizable in the world. And then you know that kind of you know passes the baton you hope to someone else who says, "Hey, how do we design computational design tools for these types of things?" It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the um, I think that the ex it's it's exactly right that uh, one of the aspects of informal is the accessibility of it. There's a kind of a democratic nature. You know, you actually use the word uh, uh, Rob in 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 your talk, um, and uh, you know, as part of that. Uh, I guess that that's also part of the motivation to kind of try to bring bring this into the design context to open up the you know the interaction uh, there. Um, maybe you could. Uh, I'd be curious about uh, what is the role of do, do you is it, it seems like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, a visual interest and conceptual interest. What's the role of aesthetics in your own in your own processes? Um, are you uh, you know, not maybe not only visual, but maybe also even conceptual. What, when do you feel like you, you know, you're, how much does that guide your own work, and how much of it is really more in terms of optimization and more sort of engineering? So, uh, I, I don't know if I have a good answer, but uh, I mean, I think that the, it certainly is one aspect of the way that we think about these systems. I mean, we're not, we're not, you know, uh, you know, it's not like uh, who, who's read Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, Artist of the Beautiful? You know this? Yes, okay. 
uh, this guy spends his, um, I'm butchering this of course, but this guy spends all of his time as a watchmaker, spends all of his time making mechanical butterflies, nobody can figure out why, and it doesn't matter why, right? That's the point. But uh, so it's not to that extreme, but we think about, you know, function, I mean, aesthetics is one function uh, of these devices. It's off, it, obvious and perhaps in the engineering world, it's not the, the most important, but, uh, you know, but I think that it's, it's sort of, you know, part of the, the role of, of engineers in general might be stretched, but certainly as academics, as educators, is to draw people in and get people excited about what you're doing and, and about you know the, some of the basic concepts that are behind some of the things that you're making and, and visually is certainly one avenue to do that. Is, uh, are, are any of you um, are any of you working Connor? You're working with designers uh, actually in your lab, or either Rob or Rob. Have, have you do you interact with designers at all in the uh, in your workspace? Only amateurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, I think we should maybe open it up to uh, some questions from the audience. Um, I don't really know how the, uh, oh, we have microphones here? Terrific. Uh, so um, please. Um, in, in the origami design, uh, how much, I understand there are some design tools, but how much of intention is, how much can you just say, I want this to turn 90 degrees, I want this to lift? or? Because it seems to me origami is a very difficult way to design. And the mechanics can be very specific while the, the folds and the cuts, whatever other uh, operations are allowed, I would have no idea how to get from an intention of lift to the design of a fold. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a rabbit's hole too because um, what you're saying I think is that you know, if I want to build just a static structure, let's say, that looks like a rabbit, you know, how do I how do I do that? How do I how do I translate that down into into two D? So that's one level. That's one sort of jump. Uh, there's tr a tremendous amount of work which I'm not qualified to describe to you that uh, that is in computational origami that people have stu are studying. You know, questions about how. Uh, you know, can I prove that that's even possible? For example, to make this particular shape, and if it is possible, then how do I think about? You know, there's potentially many solutions, many fold patterns might map to this one particular shape, so how do I think about that and how do I choose? Uh, there's computational tools which will do this. One, one off the top of my head is called Origamizer, which is uh, to, to do just that, to define sort of 3D you know, structures and then translate that down into uh, you know, viable fold patterns that are faithful to the sort of origami paradigm. There's the second level though, which is um, if I know the fold pattern, that's still not everything because that doesn't tell me how to manufacture this. Uh, especially if I want more than just sort of static structures, if I want other functionalities built into this, then there's deeper things. And that's where, for example, the work of Dan Alkis comes in and, and describes, uh, you know, methods. It, it turns out, long story short, is, which is probably not surprising, is that if I think about, you know, sort of freeform 3D constructive solid geometry sort of operations that I'd use in 3D CAD CAM machining, 3D printing, whatever, it turns out that, that the compar you know, comparable algorithms for going from 2D to 3D are, are relatively easier, let's say. Uh, and I'm not really doing this justice, but so there's the, there's the sort of you know, automation of, of thinking about design going from solid to 2D, and then there's actually realizing that structure in a foldable device. And, and getting, to that, getting to that next step of motion in from origami to a mechanism that provides a motion. Are there any CAD software, software -esque, CAD esque softwares that you're using for that? Uh, in development, I think maybe afterwards uh, you can talk with Dan. He can give you the latest uh, version, you know, describe the latest sort of capabilities of this, this software, and he could tell you all about that. I have a question for Dr. McCaudry. Uh, so I was really amazed by how you were able to uh, to 3D print liquid and solid and the soft material at the same time. And there will always be, so for, 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 for me, I don't know how it's done. So it will be obviously be challenges when you have a solid on top of liquid and there's liquid on top as well and they're, they're still solid. So if we would just stack them together, the, I would imagine the solid would just fall into the liquid below. So when you are 3D printing this, obviously in some new method, what was the challenge there? How were you able to achieve this uh, speed? 
Yeah, well, I think you put your finger on it. I mean, it's, that's definitely one of the design constraints that we have. We're lucky in that um, these liquids have roughly equivalent density. And so uh, we're able to put, uh, these, these droplets are very small. They're just a few tens of microns uh, in diameter. And so at these sizes, surface tension seems like it's one of the dominant factors. The other thing that I didn't say is that this, is, this part is built in a layer by a layer process. And so as each layer of droplets of material are deposited, a UV light cures them. And so each layer is cured, and then the next one is deposited. So um, if you and your design uh, choose to have a large lake of, of liquid, and then you try to put solid directly into the middle of that lake, there can be a problem because you don't have anything to anchor that solid to. But if you're careful about the design and do it such that as each layer is deposited, it'll have a small piece of the previous layer to hang on to, then you can actually make these things work where you have solid developed over liquid. So there are some design constraints that are that you have to respect when you're using this fabrication approach. And part of what I'm doing is trying to embed those design constraints into a software tool so that uh, people don't have to be aware of all those intricate details. In addition to the, to the overlap issue I just mentioned, there are um, some spacing issues. So you know how small you can make a particular solid piece that's surrounded by liquid, for example, and many others. So um, uh, yeah, I'm basically trying to embed those into a, a software tool. This is a big picture question. Um, <clears throat> I read Hieroglyph, which is out of uh, the Arizona State University Hieroglyph Project, which is Neil Stevenson, a science fiction writer. And it's a collection of science fiction, which is hopeful rather than dystopian, because Neil Stevenson feels that science fiction has sort of moved away from the hopeful. And in one of the stories, <clears throat> which he actually wrote, there's a, there's a comment that he makes, which is that uh, he believes, well, the person in the story believes that for a generation, people had to catch up to the idea of smart materials, which is why, for a generation, big, hopeful things didn't get built. So we had to digest the idea of reactive and smart materials in order to dream large again. So you guys are all on the forefront of that. And I'm wondering what you think of that particular comment by that particular science fiction writer. So the question is, I'm just trying to kind of understand the logic that, that we need to understand smart materials to become optimistic again, but I'm not finding the, well, I, the connection. I think the, the point that he's making is that we haven't done that. We haven't dreamt big dreams, at least in the United States, for the last 20, 30 years in the kind of ways that he's thinking about. And he thinks that perhaps that's because we had to catch up to this concept of smart materials, responsive materials, which yeah, all I, of you... I, I guess I have one related comment from a roboticist's point of view. Um, being at Harvard has been an interesting place for me um, because, you know, the engineering school and the sciences, you know, um, is so diverse and there's so many different things going on. And C's in particular, I think, is so interdisciplinary that you get exposed to things, you know, that you may not have got exposed to by being in a more, you know, traditional mechanical engineering department. I think that's one thing from my perspective. So I think I definitely would recognize from myself, being at Harvard, seeing some of the work that Rob was doing, George Whitesides, other people, you kind of start to think, hey, you come up with new ideas because you have new food for thought. And um, so I, I think it doesn't quite answer your, your question, I guess, but I, I've, I've definitely noticed that myself. It, it, if as a designer, you see, hey, here are all these building blocks I can use, it gives you the ability to come up with things that you, know, you wouldn't be able to unless you, you know, had them. I think one, just one brief follow -up. So um, as uh, the, the sort of core foundation of things like engineering ethics, states the following sort of broad principle that technology is always going to outpace the law, right? And so as engineers, we need to think about, think ethically about the things that we build, you know, because there's no jurisdiction that's going to be able to sort of manage that yet. And so I think your comment is taking that one step further and saying it's not just we need to be careful with it, but we need to harness that 
appropriately and, and try to sort of foreshadow some, some you know, benefits of this technology that's coming out. Sounds great to me. And I wonder if, if I could um, maybe push back and disagree a little bit. I mean, I think that the, the things, if you look at what we're doing now with space exploration, and I mean, even with the, the miracles that exist in our pockets, right? I mean, the, this thing actually embodies most of science fiction from 50 years ago, but we completely take it for granted. I mean, they're disposable now. So um, in the realm of 3D printing, um, space exploration is actually a huge uh, outlet and inspiration for a lot of the things that people are working on with 3D printing because of the need to fabricate unknown devices at great distance. So, um, and there are all these amazing private enterprises now. I mean, there's a private enterprise to put something on the moon, right? Um, and, and on Mars. So um, I think actually we're in an incredible time. Um, I just think that we have become so saturated by technology that it's sometimes difficult for us to observe the amazing things that are going on around us. But I mean, it also comes to mind. It's, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it was an interesting question that I think provoked a range. Um, another thing that comes to mind is the, um, in terms of say this, um, this notion of say techno optimism versus its opposite, there is something about, I think that, uh, you know, out of these labs, which I think is that sort of, there is a democratic impulse there because it isn't, you know, which I, I don't think is, like the cell phone from a user standpoint is absolutely, it's in everybody's pocket, but the DIY side of this is like, you know, that's something that I think, you know, and you're, and you're, you're all speaking to that in terms of like, you know, uh, distributing that. But there's something about the DIY movement that really is, it is about empowerment. And I guess, you know, I don't really have a question there. I'm just kind of participating in, uh, in the discussion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I want to return to the uh, aesthetic question that Chuck mentioned, which I think was sort of deflected. But I, th I think there is an aesthetic quality to each of the projects that, or each of the sort of research projects that we saw. But it doesn't have to do with the question of sort of what is a beautiful image so much as what is a beautiful behavior or a beautiful movement. I think that's a preoccupation in each, uh, in each of your work. And so I want to sort of pose that question to you and ask, is there a particular quality of movement or behavior that you aspire to um, actualize in your work? We were in the, in the example of the simulation that I showed of these uh, locomoting robots. We were hoping to find something that had a, a natural gait, and we didn't define what that was. We applied constraints. We asked how fast can the robot move in a particular point, a given amount of time? We also applied energy constraints. And so we were kind of pleased to find that gate strategies, which uh, sort of maximized those or abided by those constraints, wound up having a property that we interpreted as natural. Um, and I think that's not an accident. But, you know, there's obviously a great incentive for natural organisms to have efficient gates. But it wasn't something we imposed. I think from our perspective as well as um, something that might, we might aspire to in these designs is complexity. So, uh, and, and complexity might have different uh, definitions, but if I think about natural systems that, you know, that Rob is describing, is, you, know, you get complexity for free in some senses in natural systems because they self-organize. And so you, know, you can have you know, hierarchical structures like ourselves and you know, many, you know, whatever, however many hundreds of, of muscles and joints, et cetera, that you might have. In robotic systems, that comes at quite a cost. Uh, you know, those, you know, if you think about just complexity in terms of the number of actuated degrees of freedom you might have in a system, that's going to translate to motors, that's going to come at physical, at actual cost, and it, and it's sort of physical, physical difficulty in creating those devices. So we seek, what I'm trying to say is we seek methods by which we can, uh, not have great penalties for creating systems with many joints, many articulation, you know, means of articulation, means of embedding, not just physical actuation, but sensors, et cetera. And that, that is a particular quality that is of great value to us. Yeah, I think just to comment on that, sorry, for our stuff, I think it's, it's dynamic motions, I would say. So in particular for walking, I think when people walk, they move in a very dynamic way. And, all of us can probably spot when someone's moving efficiently and when someone's not moving efficiently. Because there's this exchange between potential and kinetic energy, you know, your center of mass goes up and down, your legs move like pendulums, your body moves like a pendulum. So, you know, with our systems, we're, we're, we, we do consider those dynamics. 
And I guess we try and deliver assistance in a way that you know, is compatible with those dynamics. So for instance, if someone is on a swing moving back and forth, when do you give like a little burst of assistance? You give it like at the right time, and then that can sustain that oscillation. So it's kind of similar with walking. We're trying to figure out what are those right times in order to keep the motion being as dynamic as and, possible. And Connor, I'm curious. I was thinking about that. What about the, um, uh, the subjective uh, experience? I mean, I, you've, you, you showed the quantitative uh, evaluation. But do you like debrief with your, uh, you know, with your subjects, and they say that felt good or it didn't feel good? Yeah, so it, it, it's different. I think for healthy people, you know, it, it's harder for them to notice an effect. You know, you do notice that the suit is assisting, but it, as soon as you turn it off, your biological muscles have actually adapted to doing less work than they normally would. So your legs feel like they're in quicksand when you walk. Um, for for stroke patients who normally have to concentrate very hard on moving they say that they no longer have to think about walking when the assistance is being applied. So it's different for different people. I was gonna ask one of the aspects that architects have tried to have move over time is facades and uh, other aspects, heliostats, for example, which would track the sun. I wondered if that interested any of you at all. And another, another topic uh, that occurs to me uh, has to do with library and information science. Um, this is a little more abstract, but uh, as you all know, books are leaving libraries or have left. Um, but I'm intrigued that uh, 3D movies and 3D visualization has not, you know, gone away, or that we're actually getting more interested in that. Um, and so, um, the kinesthetics and the the coming towards us and moving away from us properties of the robotics that you're showing are intriguing to me as as a way of I think amplifying uh, learning through engaging our senses. And I'm just curious if you see any, any opportunities in either of those categories. It's, it's certainly true for, for example, for STEM education. I mean, that's certainly a, a method. I mean, robotics is sort of inherently cool. It's got science fiction-esque uh, aspects of it. And, you know, it's pretty easy to get kids excited about robots. So, I mean, at least in, in terms of, you know, younger kids, students, et cetera, that, Quite powerful. Um, I had a quick question about um, you shared a variety of different scales and types of robots that you had produced, and they each had a different solution for how they had an energy source. Um, some were tethered, some had PV cells, some I believe had internal batteries. And I'm really curious if you could elaborate on the challenges and limitations of distributed power sources for these devices, and as you scale up, you, you know, run into really interesting challenges. Hard. Yeah. yeah. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the one of the grand. I mean, if I had the equivalent of muscle and fat in a robot, I'd do it. I could build you anything you want, but I don't. So it's hard. <laughs> There's a a project idea that we were kicking around the lab for quite a while. Um, it wasn't exactly a heliostat, I suppose, but it's sort of inspired by a Stron beast. It's a, sort of a robot concept that would use uh, thermal expansion materials like wax to kind of harness the power of the sun and then move throughout a landscape on a diurnal cycle. And um, I think that it would be really cool to see somebody build that. So maybe somebody will. <laughs> we should probably, uh, we're getting, we're a little bit over now, so maybe we'll take one more question and then uh, we can go and you can, hopefully uh, these guys will stick around for a little bit and you can ask them individually. Hi. Um, some of you mentioned uh, about uh, empowerment on the, the democratization of technology and allowing other people to do the same thing as you guys do. Uh, obviously, um, for a lot of people who doesn't have access to machines that you guys use to fabricate your robots or skills uh, to design those robots, um, I understand you're designing your systems to allow other people to do this. Uh, what are the compromises that you have to take? Uh, to, on one hand, allow people easy access, but on the other hand, allowing, you know, sophistication? Uh, I could answer, I, could, I mean, one, it's not uh, exactly uh, for individuals, but it's actually kind of interesting to bring uh, some of the techniques probably closest to what you're doing, Rob, uh, in, in your lab into the design school, uh, because basically with a, a laser, once you have a laser cutter in the mix, you can, uh, you can do an extraordinary amount of the, uh, of the techniques uh, that Rob showed, maybe not the miniaturization, et cetera. So, um, uh, and that would be sort of applicable, you know, with the right cookbook of techniques. 
outside of it. But, but, but I think, and you're right. But and 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 you know, you say you say like laser cutter, and you think, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's actually they're actually you know, this is part of the Moore's law thing where. You know, the, all of these technologies are becoming cheaper, more accessible inherently of themselves. I mean, not maybe not today. You'd be able to go out and buy something that would be able to make these little robots. But, uh, but I think there's a natural progression towards that. Uh, and so we just try to make our techniques, you know, not s too specific to a particular tool, because that tool is going to change, uh, or that tool might be too expensive now, or it might change in the future. So we try to make them, you know, more broadly applicable to. to Things that are you know that are more accessible. You know, printers aren't going away. 3D printers aren't going away. Something that is able to cut something. Okay, you know, so so just more abstract notions of how to sort of piece things together, and then the software tools to assist you to do that. Okay, well, thank you all. Come on out, uh, get some uh, get some food and drink, and look at look at some informal robots. Thank you.